preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. Um, sorry for the delay, but we're ready to get going now. Uh, I'm Daniel Stern, Director of Humanities at the 92nd Street Y. I'd like to welcome you to the third evening in our Artist Vision series. Uh, we got off to a, an extraordinary start with Nancy Graves and then last week with Robert Motherwell. And tonight we um, are extraordinarily honored to have Kenneth Noland, um, who's an uh, extraordinary, wonderful show. Uh, I actually saw it about um, four weeks ago, and um, I'm not sure if it's still on, but they can tell you later. Um, it was uh, quite, a, quite a wonderful show of old and new pieces. But my main job right now is to welcome you all and to say just a few words about um, our moderator, Jack Flam, um, who has put together this extraordinary series with so much uh, interest and imagination. Jack Flam is professor of history at, of, of art history at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of City University of New York. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and he's won a fellowship awarded by the National Endowment for the Humanities as well. Um, as I said before, he's the, art, he's the art critic for the Wall Street Journal, uh, where he does uh, probably the liveliest uh, art criticism on any regular basis that I've seen. He's won first prize in the manufa uh, Manufacturer's Hanover Art World Award for Distinguished Newspaper Art Criticism. And in 1987, Jack Flam won the Charles Rufus Maury Award for Distinguished Scholarship and Art Criticism. This last award was for his book, Matisse, the Man and His Art, 1869 to 1918. Jack is, um, uh, has wide-ranging interests, although he's uh, extraordinarily well-known as a uh, Matisse scholar and a uh, modernist scholar. And uh, with great pleasure now, I turn over the evening to Jack Flam and Kenneth Nolan. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you again for coming. It's an enormous pleasure to have Kenneth Noland here tonight. Um, uh, Kenneth Noland is another artist who needs virtually no introduction. Um, he was trained in part at Black, Black Mountain uh, and in Paris at Osip Zadkin's uh, studio and has, among other things, taught in a number of uh, universities and colleges, Catholic University in Washington, Pratt Institute, Bard College, and has had a long association with Bennington College in Vermont. Most especially, Kenneth Nolan is uh, known as one of the really great colorists of the 20th century, and uh, an artist not only who is a great colorist, but who has taken uh, a position that is, I think, rather an involved one in terms of the, the, the contrast between design and color, a contrast that goes all the way back to the early Renaissance, back to the, the contrast that were always drawn between Florence and Venice, between instinct and intellect, between sensuality and austerity. And one of the things that's so uh, impressive about Kenneth Nolan's work is that somehow he has managed to, in his paintings, combine the sensuality and instinctual uh, electricity of color with an intellectual austerity that is quite impressive. So it's a, really a great pleasure to welcome Kenneth Nolan here tonight. And um, I thought what we would do, as we have for the last couple of weeks, start with a couple of slides. If we could have the house lights down and the first slide up. Um, because I, I would like to start by asking a question that goes back to an early painting. Um, the painter Matisse once remarked that a major artist senses a potentiality, an historical potentiality, and is able to fill that potentiality. And I want to ask Ken as the first question, 
um, how, at the time that you were doing these early mature paintings of yours in the late 1950s, you saw your situation? Um, <clears throat> Well, um, in the late 40s, early 50s, um, there, there was a lot of information around for that, um, those that were lucky, and lucky enough to uh, find their their way to uh, sources, to the sources. There wasn't a great uh, <clears throat> art scene in the 50s. Um, and uh, late 40s, or mid-late 40s. After all, it was right after the Second World War. And um, there was reconstituting <clears throat> a world that was going on, and but around uh, we had, had had the advantage in this country <clears throat> of had having had refugees, artists uh, that had come to the United States and found places in universities or art schools to live out the Second World War. Comes to mind Bella Bartok, who <coughs> got here, uh, was at Columbia University. Uh, it was catch as catch can for him and his wife, um, because they're, they're just uh, incidentally, there's great, uh, there's a book I just read about a year, year ago, uh, Bartok's Letters. Can you hear me? Did you lose, did I lose my mic? Oh, okay, let's help me with it, will you? Yeah. There we go. All right, Pat, uh, Bartok's Letters. Get, you, you get that. Does it sound better now? No. no. Is it possible to turn up the amplification system? Okay. They're going to turn up the amplification <clears throat> system. I feel like I'm shouting. There you go. How's that? <laughs> Here we go. All right, Bella Bartok, letters. And I, I was just using uh, Bartok as a, uh, an example of someone who came to this country during the Second World War out of necessity. And uh, uh, he was at Columbia, and then um, he had to have students besides that, and he got around, kind of. Um, but anyway, um, got his music here, too, and uh, as well as a lot of the visual artists uh, that you all, I'm sure, know about. Well, uh, you could kind of find out a, about that. I, I was a veteran, and I had the GI Bill, and there was Black Mountain College, was near where I had grown up. And I luckily managed to find out about that school. And uh, of course, there were people there that was, uh, there, were, there were the Bauhaus uh, contingent that had come there as well as uh, out in Chicago. So um, there was a lot of luck, I think, involved in finding sources. But the sources were around. Uh, Hoffman was in uh, Provincetown, New York. And uh, those two sources, um, Uh, particularly Black Mountain, I think, probably had, I keep noticing the influence at uh, uh, the Bauhaus through uh, Black Mountain has had not only, say, 
on a growth in abstract art, but also uh, a growth and part of the development of pop, pop art, hmm. including theater, performances, etc. Um, I see it. I see it. Uh, it's very clear to me. When you started up, the abstract expressionist painting was also kind of a, a big force and, and something to sort of react against too and absorb. Well, it wasn't. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't that. Um, it wasn't that around. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, um, it wasn't that the artist hadn't been, the older, that generation of artists hadn't uh, uh, began to meet each other. Mm -hmm. And they also had, for instance, Celia Bolotovsky was at Black Mountain. He was part of the AAA. He had met uh, Mondrian. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Mondrian had come over. So it was much more narrow and much more specific. And you have to understand that uh, the abstract expressionists didn't begin to get successful until the early 50s, really, mm -hmm. the late 48, 49, 50, 51, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they began to be able to get shows, like at Coots, as an example. Up until that time, uh, the, most all the galleries in New York were showing uh, European artists. So it wasn't as if there was a scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, when, when did you first become familiar with abstract painting? At Black Mountain College. At Black Mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought what we would do is look at a couple of slides before we turn on the lights again um, in terms of starting with what one might call early mature work, not Kenneth Nolan's first paintings, but the first really original and strong paintings that he did that made people notice him as uh, a major artist, um, and which at the time were extraordinarily radical. Um, unfortunately, I don't, we don't have too many slides of this fantastic Chevron series. Um, now, one thing I wanted to ask you about is between the Target paintings and the Chevron, there's, in a, in a sense, uh, an enormous transformation. And could you talk a little bit about how you were working at the time, I mean, physically, uh, toward the, uh, in relation to the physicality of your paintings. <clears throat> uh, that's a good way of putting it. And of course, uh, the physicality of um, painting was something that was uh, <clears throat> part of abstract expressionism, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, properly that um, emphasized in, say, the work of de Kooning, which, you know, was, uh, had a figurative uh, uh, kind of a aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Or the, uh, even the gestural painters, I'd say Klein, and so forth. But it was more uh, the physical, uh, the real uh, Matier thing was a Pollock. I saw, I saw, I, um, I was kind of drawn to that. Mm -hmm. Morris Lewis and I were drawn to that. And to Hoffman, because it was uh, very, very emphatically and forcefully stuff, what I call stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Matier. Uh, very present, um, not not a tendency to take you uh, uh, into some kind of imagery, um, although they were ghost-like images in Paula. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, I'd say that the images in Pollock were something like the images in Matisse which 
in a way, a kind of ghost-like, mm -hmm. or uh, depersonalized. Not Picasso. Picasso depicts and made very strong caricatures, almost, of images. But Matisse was always kind of erasing the specific characteristics of, of a person. Mm -hmm. So um, this was kind of floating around in all this. And um, so we were, you don't, this doesn't come to you like a brainstorm or a sudden insight. These things come to you from practicing and uh, really messing around mm -hmm. more than trying to figure out what to do. You have to work your way into it and through it to get to get to certain things. But I think that in a lot of cases that uh, um, artists think before they act. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why don't we run through these pretty yeah. quickly? Uh, I think everybody's just about seen them. Mm -hmm. That's obviously yeah. Sorry, uh, this is the de detail of a wider painting. And uh, go ahead. This is not hanging at the right angle, mm -hmm. so it's it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What? They, they couldn't hear you that time. Oh, you still can't hear me? I think I think it's. What am I going to do? Talk. I think it's because you were turned away. Oh, okay. From the picture. Now, if uh, you want to. Right, recent work. Now, could we have the lights back up? I don't know what it is about this, uh, unless I talk down like this, which I don't want to do. Cause no, I think it's, it's from turning toward the pictures. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how, how did New York, how has living away from New York affected your, your work generally? Well, um, I think the way you live, the way you live, the way an artist lives, uh, has a great deal to do with uh, how it affects his art. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, there are quite a few artists that are uh, living away from New York, I guess, when they get the money, <laughs> they get a place in the country. Mm -hmm. As do movie stars. There we go. How about and that? And anybody. Okay. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, um, or they can go back and forth. But I, um, um, I'm very interested in. Um, I, 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 it's not interested. I care about uh, being outdoors. I, I, I like to. I like to be. Um, I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like being out. <laughs> Wait, one of the things that that your painting does, and something that's been spoken of a lot in relation to your painting, is that the subject matter, such as it is, is inherent in the painting itself. Let's say natural subject matter isn't something that's depicted, trees, flowers, etc., although experience is in it. And could you talk a little bit about how you see the, not the subject matter in terms of what's depicted, but subject in relation to your <clears throat> painting? Well, I, li I listen to a lot of music, and uh, uh, there, are the, there are the sounds of things. There's the sound of music, and then there are sometimes the lyrics of music, but um, I think that almost, I think that in all art, there's 
uh, depending on what kind of art it is. Uh, there's a voice, the sound of a voice. There's sounds. There's sound in Faulkner uh, that you can uh, you can read a paragraph probably out of context, and you could tell that it's Faulkner because it has a makes it resonates in a way. And the sound of musicians. Musicians talk about sounds a lot. I mean, somebody's sound, mm -hmm. the sound of somebody. And uh, uh, they're really talking about precisely list that they get the sense of uh, what's being communicated out of the sound and not out of uh, the words, because most uh, instrumental music is sound. Mm -hmm. It's any sound. Uh, looking at a painting can function the same way or a piece of sculpture. Um, we look and we not only judge things by uh, but the way we identify them as objects, we judge them in terms of their proportions, the color, the color, the color of the sky, color of water, Unfortunately, we don't pay enough attention to the color of the water and the color of the sky. Mm. Um, so there's no reason that that can't become expressive in a visual work of art. When, when you're working, do you actually think of areas of color as having a, a literal sound equivalent, or is that too literal? Oh, uh, well, it doesn't have to have a sound. I mean, it has a, it has a, it has a feel. It has a mm -hmm. feeling. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be a feel. It also can be a specific density, mm -hmm. or a kind of matness, mm -hmm. or it will let some light come out, or it won't let light come out, or it'll uh, get stuffy, or it'll get cool. Or just like a breeze. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tactile. Color is tactile. Material is tactile. Color is tactile. And we have to describe it, we have to describe the color in tactile terms. It's glassy, it's shiny, it's mapped, it's dense, it's uh, woolly, mm -hmm. etc. You were saying before we were talking, uh, that at the same time that, that there's a, a strong sense of musicality in a lot of your work, the whole notion of performance in a work of art is something that you're not, which is, is not presence in your work, and which you find problematical, or art that is theatrical. Well, um, performance, you can be very conscious of performance, as you perform. And I think that one reason that uh, people practice their art, whether it's mu making music or, or making paintings or sculpture, is to learn how to make it without, in a way, performing it. Uh, at it's, uh, it's kind of different than, say, thinking about how to make a picture look. Mm -hmm. Or, say, what to choose a subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, and make the material depict that to indicate that, or to be gestural, as an example. That's performing. Um, acting, it's, it's, uh, and I, I don't mean, they're not just like a actor acts, but I mean the act of acting. Um, should, I think, be, un, uh, be um, uh, not self-conscious. Mm. Shouldn't really be aware of that because it's, uh, it should be at a sensation level. 
it's um, well, that's where the fun is. How do you title your paintings? Um, I title paintings after after I make them. After you make them, yeah. And do you do you do you do you seem to draw on similar kinds of associations in your titles? You think or literary associations or is it is it something that comes spontaneously or do you find that you run a series of titles? Well, words. Um, I mean, like in poetry, um, I find, you know, uh, if you can isolate a word sometime, uh, or a little phrase, um, and because it gets isolated, not just, if it's, let's say, part of, it's not a poetic, it's kind of poetic, uh, and it is kind of, like, uh, uh, titles can be kind of descriptive, about a feeling that uh, you can have about uh, the feeling of something. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like to title paintings. I mean, it bothers me when, uh, for some reason, I miss, uh, miss the chance to say, put a title on a painting, which happens sometimes because you just go ahead. You're going, going forward and you can't, can't get it. But I, <clears throat> I like the fact that they have names. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I do uh, is uh, use racing forms uh, for racehorses. <laughs> 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 because all racehorses have to have a different name from all other racehorses. <laughs> and people, for some reason, because they're na naming, uh, naming uh, animals, or an animal, horses, uh, get very uh, poetic yeah. and yeah. very affectionate, <laughs> so they make good names. Uh, what is what is what is the rhythm of your working day like? You know, what's a sort of a typical working day for? You? Well, probably like, pretty much uh, the, the same as most other people, except I don't have you know to go punch in. <laughs> <I don't have> <laughs> But I, uh, I have to, you know, I, uh, um, I try to get some news in the morning, like you, probably. Um, Do you have an assistant that works with you? Um, I, yeah, off and on. Mm -hmm. I've had a string of assistants. Um, but it's, uh, it's um, like anybody's day, it's just, you know, you, you you come up you come up against what in the hell's going on every day. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, lately, which I don't think any of us can really believe, uh, one of the things that uh, has changed all of our, our <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got to do this somehow. I just can't. I'm driving people out of here. <laughs> uh, know this: the fact that. Uh, uh, they take broken down the wall, the wall. I mean, I think it's just really unbelievable. I thought what went on in uh, Beijing before they cracked down over there was fantastic. And uh, what I noticed was that uh, this is called everybody unawares. But it seems like to me that somehow or another the Russians had some indication that this was probably going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they already had made some kind of accommodation for it to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. That's the impression. But what I've noticed is that uh, uh, people on television that, that we see now, the people that are coming across, the announcers, uh, the politicians, just everybody that you see it's like a spasm or like some suddenly there's been a breakthrough that has made us all come into some kind of large contact at some level where uh, uh, it's startling us all. This was a bit just oh, did it. Okay, let me just hold this thing. I think, that's, I think this yeah. is better. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just absolutely 
amazing. Now this might be a kind of a breakthrough, it's a kind of a, an emotional psychological breakthrough that is broken through too deeply. But I know that we all, everybody hopes that it's not, mm. and that somehow or another, uh, the e economics, the, so soci the society structures, and so and we can find uh, cultural structures, can find some way to accommodate it and let it begin to flourish because this this could be you know like mm -hmm. the beginning of a the way uh, the world should be. Have you have you shown your paintings in, in Eastern Europe ever? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're conscious of. Because um, they seem to have been a predilection against abstract art in general in I, in in Eastern Europe. That was uh, that was uh, that was true before. And so yeah. I, I mean you know back in the 30s, 40s, 50s and yeah. so art. Yeah. Late, and then also it was something akin to what went on in this country too. You know there was a very strong anti uh, abstract uh, modernist uh, uh, bent. Mm -hmm. You you remember? Yeah. When you, I don't know whether you're old enough, but the, yeah, there was a lot of uh, it was associated with all kinds of dire, mean, awful, mm -hmm. wow, how nonsense. Do you, how do you see looking looking back now? How do you see modernism, modernist art, as and and abstract art? How do you you know how do you see it in relation to traditional art? Well, uh, uh, modern art uh, has uh, is our traditional art, mm -hmm. and it goes back. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of work that's being done, uh, historical work that's being done to f uh, investigate the sources of uh, what we would call modern is modern mm -hmm. art. And uh, I mean, the postmodernism is uh, it's no different than pop art. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. Uh, I think it's it's a phase, and it's uh, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a style. It's kind of uh, maybe it's a more playful way to to make uh, buildings. It really came from architecture. It didn't come out of painting, but it did come out of uh, it did come out of the visual arts because it came out of pop art. Uh, yeah. That extension, of that direction. You, you, you were saying earlier that there was, you see a kind of smoothness in a lot of contemporary imagery, visual and imagery. imagery, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the images that we see in magazines, television, videos, uh, movies, Walt Disney. Caricatures, animation. Yeah, there's a, there's a, it's a whole and pop art, pop culture. It's not only in the music; it's in the, it's in the visual, <clears throat> it's in the, the writing. I, I know I'm not saying anything that everybody here doesn't already know. But <clears throat> there's some. Um, um, it's kind of airless for one thing. The, the air has been taken out of the imagery. It's been taken out. The color has uh, moved, uh, filled up all of the spaces, so there's no air between uh, an object and an object anymore. There's no, uh, it goes from color to color to color, right? Mm -hmm. Like, say, in Hockney, or like, say, in uh, a Walt Disney, earlier Walt Disney cartoon, or even in the new, uh, even in, the, in politics, the campaigns, when uh, things were staged and it was this kind of smooth, uniform visual presentation. And incidentally, they do, it's been said, of course, that uh, <clears throat> a picture's worth a thousand images. And uh, it looks like to me that uh, these, uh, the this kind of pictorialness that's going on, that <clears throat> some, for some reason, the, the reasoning or the reason kind of get subsumed 
by this kind of visual thing that uh, uh, homogenizes and makes the difference between uh, good and bad and judgment not relevant mm -hmm. to the acceptance of these uh, this, uh, images of these images. So that uh, what with uh, war movies uh, uh, and actual scenes of violence and so forth. Uh, versus other kind of humor or uh, other kind of themes and so forth, it all gets it's leveled, <coughs> it gets evened and smoothed out, rendered <coughs> uh, uh, and <coughs> kind of almost like a, sy a systematic elimination of meaning. Mm. That's what it really amounts to. It's an inflated mediocrity. And uh, it suspends judgment. Judgment uh, uh, has nothing to do with anything anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. Had, when you think about the viewers for your paintings, I mean, you think obviously you're thinking of, of other kinds of people. Do you ever actually watch people watch, look at your paintings in galleries, like when the show is at Salander O'Reilly? Well, uh, if, if, if when you go to museums and so forth, if the museums are very special uh, places, and people do very uh, very special things in museums that they don't, uh, or galleries, or viewing viewing art. Uh, it's a, I've said this before. Uh, it's a kinetic thing, and uh, <clears throat> if you've watched, if you and I know that probably everybody has watched other people in galleries. Uh, uh, when somebody comes in front of a, a painting or piece of sculpture, uh, unconsciously, their 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 sense of uh, kinetic sense, their sense of balance, they begin to uh, tilt their heads, or they tilt their head back. Their arms might uh, begin to move, and it's all oh, this is kind of involuntary, and this is from the eyes. This is communication from the eyes to, to the sen to the sense of kinetic senses, mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of adjust to the scales, the size, to the mood, and uh, this kind of artistic expression, this kind of uh, artistic content, the perspective, uh, that uh, the insight that the artist had set up. And they want to get in tune with uh, that perspective towards, say, a subject matter. I know what you would say. I'm going to go ahead and continue. Yeah. So that uh, a subject matter in a painting is something that uh, when, when you first see it, we, you, you probably identify that painting with the subject matter. By the subject matter, your still life, a portrait, a landscape. And you probably are, are interested in seeing uh, how much like, say, a person that, uh, if it's a portrait, that it, that it is. Mm -hmm. But it soon, uh, soon you begin to take on the perspective of the artist. It's like the artistic content, the art, artist's perspective, his insight, his vision, begins begins to establish what you begin to admire in that work of art. It's not the subject matter. It's not the theme. The theme is present. The theme is part of it. But it's the, it's the work. It's that thing, that painting, mm -hmm. that artist, that, that Cezanne, that Manet, that Monet. Mm -hmm. That Corot, that Picasso, that Matisse. It's that that we keep going back to, and it's a source. That's the source of uh, continuing nourishment. Whether you go back and see it or not, it resonates. It stays in your head, just like music, just like good music. The opposite of this is entertainment. 
And entertainment is useful precisely because it's waste. It uh, it used up uh, at once. In a way, you can go back and see a good movie once or twice, but it diminishes. It's gradually diminishing in its uh, effect. Mm -hmm. But good art sets itself as self aside as a as we, we, we file it away and we put it over in its special place. We assign it to its category. That's Cezanne. And that's why we we have all of those artists they're assigned their places why we protect them, we cherish them. And you don't have to keep seeing them. Uh, Rimois son, I, I, I keep I used this before, but the the, the uh, movie maker mm -hmm. uh, said about his father. His father told him one time that he said, when a, you bring a painting into a house, he says at first you look at it quite a lot. You stop and you look at it, and uh, you enjoy it. But gradually, you get so you don't really look at it that much that you. Uh, you start uh, walking past it, but you sense it and you feel it in its place, and you want it there. And I, in that sense, I think that uh, a work of art is like like another person, mm -hmm. or like an animal almost. Or, but it's there, and a um, its presence is there in memory, or its presence can be there without you having to confront it. Just like a good book. Um, so, in, in that sense, um, it doesn't make any difference, I don't think, whether a, a work of art, if it can be arrived at in some, some way out of art, has to be representational, uh, as, as such, mm -hmm. or that it has to have a subject matter that uh, you, you use initially to identify, to identify by. Did, have you seen the, the painting of yours that's in the lobby of the Museum Tower building next to the Museum of Modern Art? Yeah. Or, you don't like the way it's placed? Sure, it's okay. And I wonder, because I, I, on the other hand, was very impressed by it, by exactly what you're talking about. People walk in, it's a very beautiful, painting was a dark, dull green ground in the museum tower, which is the apartment house next to the Museum of Modern Art. And when people walk in, they look at it, they do a double take, because they don't expect to see a major painting in a lobby like that, in terms of you know <laughs> the incongruousness. I don't think they think it's a major painting. <laughs> it might confuse them about uh, the door. I mean, maybe they thought they might be going through the wrong door. <laughs> Just storing it on the wall, eh? Yeah, right. That's just about what it amounts to. They are stored on walls. All, all paintings are stored on the wall. It's another thing about, uh, about paintings uh, uh, that... <clears throat> I mean about art. Art uh, becomes a uh, a, a, a measure of value. I mean, it's one, it's one of the great measures of value, the best measure of value, if you ask me. Uh, but um, art can be bought and sold. Um, but nobody can own it. It can't be owned by, even though it's in somebody's collection, it doesn't belong to them. It's, what do you call? Uh, they're custodians, right? Mm -hmm. They can have it, and it gives value, and they've got something that represents great value, but eventually it has to belong to everybody. It has, it, they have to give it up and put it in the museum. Well, they have to lend it out. Some people hold them, hold on to them longer than others, but eventually, it's it belongs to anybody who can look at it, can see it, just like just like a book. Mm -hmm. right? How do you? 
how do you find the the I mean what the way the market is operating today, especially in terms of recent modern <laughs> paintings? Do you do you find a reassuring, distressing, some combination of the two? Nah. I think <laughs> <laughs> that comes from Clement Greenberg. <laughs> nah. Uh, no, it's um, what it's it's, it's, um, it's part of popularity. It's in the context of popularity, and popularity is in uh, in the nature of entertainment. It's in the nature of consumption. Uh, it's uh, in the spread of um, of. Uh, of uh, events that uh, become have become part of the economy. If people really realize the price that they pay for entertainment, I mean, in, in terms of the quality of life, I mean, if it really got spelled out in a way that uh, it could be spelled out, mm -hmm. I think everybody would be pretty shocked because we're paying one hell of a price in terms of the environment and the emotional environment. Or the facts of life, uh, environment, for uh, to keep this economy going on the basis of, uh, to a large extent, of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say this real quick. Um, there's not, there's not not enough in the world. There's too much. There's a surplus of everything. There's a surplus of labor, surplus of raw material, surplus of technology. There's too much. Uh, so we don't know how to use it. It turns into waste. It gets turned into waste. It gets turned into storing up armaments, obsolescence, waste. Uh, and uh, most people think of um, the environment, the pollution of the environment, as being like out there in the grass or in the water or something like that. But there's pollution in, our, in, in, in uh, the emotions, there's pollution in the, in the mind. Mm -hmm. There's pollution in, in the context of uh, our context. It is in the context of uh, content of our life. And do you find that, that this is something that students that you deal with are aware of, art students on the whole? I think that probably now they're m m more career-minded. I mean, you know, they're thinking, uh, so look, what are, what are all the images that are around? Mm -hmm. The images are uh, of successful uh, stars. I mean, kind of like a star system. What, mm -hmm. what have they got to look for? I mean, and they make, they make uh, the entertainment is gotten in a way so mindless it doesn't uh, it has no it doesn't it's not encouraging young people to stay away from drugs mm -hmm. or to think or to keep themselves their heads clear sells love sells nostalgia and sentimentality mm -hmm. and and nonsense it's really uh, it's really Mm -hmm. Very pervasive. Uh, oh, something else I wanted to ask is that, for you as an artist, has does the process of teaching generate ideas for you? That that later, you can. You, I mean, when I say ideas, I mean I don't know how really to phrase it. Whether I don't mean necessarily mental ideas, but things that are useful to you in your own work, or is there a kind of separation between te teaching? as you do it, and then painting as you do it. I think you're asking a question yourself. I mean, this is a question, yeah. <laughs> because I, you teach, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I don't teach that much. But I know in, uh, the, uh, in, in the realm of teaching, when you, when you are teaching, sure. Because, I mean, you're, you've got uh, young, young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you want to teach them something. You want to, you want, uh, to put them in a position to be able to learn things. I mean, not, not just to teach them things, but for, put them in a position so that they can learn things. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. I don't do it, in, I'm not teaching enough to... For that to be a, yeah, a real concern. To, to, to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. 
Something I wanted to ask you about your recent work, that is the work of the last four or five years, is that the, the sense of touch, of, of, of maybe I should say of overt touch, is, is more obvious than in, in a lot of your work, let's say, of the, of the 60s and 70s. And um, I also noticed that in some of the recent paintings you're using plastic strips as definers. Um, this, the, where do you think the impulse for that comes from? Where, where, what, what were you trying to, to do with moving away from the, the, uh, the less inflected surface? Uh, well, I mean, shaping, I mean, you know, the question of shaping. Um, which is. You know, uh, painter, painters in the past uh, shaped pictures, like uh, put them in uh, tondos, and uh, depending on architectural uh, necessity and so forth. Uh, the cubist uh, became very uh, involved in um, um, shaping inside uh, inside pictures, hmm. not so much from the outside. Although they did elongate uh, uh, the paintings to make figures, and then say, uh, and make them possibly a little more uh, fat to, to make still lives, and uh, maybe a little more horizontal to make landscapes. They were these kinds of proportions, uh, depending on the kinds of subject matter. Um, of course, the difference between a still life, which is very dense, a very solid, uh, up close kind of scale in a picture. Uh, you're not very far from a table on mm -hmm. a still life. You're not, uh, usually in a portrait, you're not very far from a person. But in a landscape, you, allegorical uh, paintings and so forth, you can be all kinds of uh, various differences of, of distance and scales. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, all those differences of uh, different of, of scales, distances, of uh, opacities and transparencies, or solidities and uh, emptiness and so forth, are present in the the material of making paintings. It's in it's uh, been arrived at it on canvas, on boards, with paint, mm -hmm. and it's amazing. That's just a it's a it's a world that uh, uh, that's been established in the history of uh, in the history of art. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's wonderful, and it's it's miraculous that uh, in the history of art that uh, the painters did what they did, like, but also in music like Beethoven, and Mozart, and Bach, the sounds, uh, the range of sounds, to get a hundred musicians to play, to do a symphony. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to, to get those get those instruments made, and to get those sounds, get them tuned, and then to write that, the accomplishment is miraculous. So there is this history of uh, language that are in are in arts. It's in painting too. Um, and we go we we look we go back we look and we learn. We see what's uh, what's uh, been done, and you have to start basically. I think probably right from about your generation to the generation right before you. It seems to, I think and with artists that's the way we get into art history. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I did this with David Smith. David Smith used uh, we used to go around to the museums, and uh, David uh, was in a position as a sculptor, he was older than me, of showing me uh, how things that we knew about in our, our terms, the terms that we were working in, uh, where the presidents uh, we, we had gone way, way back, mm -hmm. ways of doing things. So um, <clears throat> the new work, um, um, I, um, 
most 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 of these times you you tell what you've you, you've been doing after the fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you you get these funny kind of impulses that come from uh, the accumulation of uh, experiences that don't come together uh, uh, at like thoughts, like ideas. They have to come together uh, kind of unconsciously, subconsciously, and kind of uh, intuitive. Mm -hmm. In intuition being informed instinct. So um, there's could be presidents in your own work. They can be presidents in uh, all of the work that's informed your uh, your work. Um, it's a question of influence. And most people, when they uh, uh, talk about, they ask you something about were you influenced by this or that or the other. It usually it's kind of slightly embarrassing because it's very hard to answer that whether you've been influenced by, say, a person. I mean, you, you, you're influenced by anybody that you listen to can tell you something that informs you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use it. Uh, you can use anything that comes to you. So uh, I see you got some uh, cubist, a kind of physical cub cubist thing in these pictures. Not that it's probably not in... Uh, a lot of other uh, mm -hmm. art that's going on, but and the way I'm, uh, it's somehow it's a little bit different the way I'm doing it. The plaid pictures caused me a lot of trouble, uh, and I didn't quite uh, get that ever straightened out, uh, so it, uh, I could settle into it comfortably as a series of work, mm -hmm. which doesn't I don't think it's so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, uh, that has, has something to do with these the new pictures. Yeah, yeah I noticed the format. You know, and also. paper making, and uh, making monoprints, and uh, using, uh, actually using more uh, handwork mm -hmm. and so forth, which is a great pleasure for me mm -hmm. at my age. Um, could, if people have questions, as in past weeks, could you pass the cards over to the ushers and they'll be passed up? I have just one or two more questions that I'd like to ask briefly. And one of them has to do with, to pick up from what you were just talking about, with sculpture and in terms of making things. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I know that you've worked with Tony Caro painting sculpture, but I don't know whether you've made your own sculpture. Have you? <laughs> Yeah, I've made I've made about uh, oh, eight or ten pieces. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty hard it's, for me. Mm -hmm. it takes it takes me a long time. I, um, but it's not that I'm not interested in uh, the sculptural characteristics, mm -hmm. and I have been for a long time. Yeah, I mean Did that's part of being a painter. Do you think that the paper making, you know, there was a kind of progression in terms of that, that physicality of paper making and sculpture, which I think happened, did they happen around the same time or not? It happened at a time when uh, abstract art uh, was, in, uh, was under a great deal of pressure from uh, uh, the changing of the way art was going mm -hmm. in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, the late 60s, uh, 60s and 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is that in, in modernism, abstract uh, uh, abstraction has been approached over and over and over, and it's it's like an impulse that's in uh, what's called modern modernist mm -hmm. art that uh, has been approached and uh, by and has been what uh, <clears throat> reacted against, but the impulse is still there. I mean, it's still it, the impulse is still the modernist abstract impulse is still 
in existence. Mm -hmm. And it will be picked up again. Because it's, it's uh, for one thing, it's, uh, it's equated with the question of quality now. Not that it, uh, it hasn't always been. Mm -hmm. The issue of qu quality, I think, has been very omnipresent in abstract art. Mm -hmm. one, one of the questions that's very interesting is, do you sketch or draw uh, and that do your that your do your paintings ever evolve out of sketching and drawing? Yeah, some, uh, but no, not not in that sense. Mm -hmm. Draw, making something is uh, is drawing. Anytime mm -hmm. you make anything, if you make a pot, if you make a piece of ceramic or something, that's drawing. Uh, uh, they mean when that, that question means uh, do you depict do you do you depict things mm -hmm. like do you make a depiction of a painting you're going to make right. which is does your paintings evolve from these or do they appear as complete shapes before you paint them no they they grow I mean if they get put they get put together as you're I mean, working yeah, on it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a practice. And so it's not there. Sometimes uh, I might, uh, very seldom, but sometimes I'll get an idea if I'm off on a road somewhere and it, it, I'll write down black, red, and Kelly green or something. Or I'll draw something. But I don't, I never really ever do those things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was almost enough just to get it uh, conscious and uh, let it go. How do you deal with a painting that you don't seem to be able to finish? Do you put it away for a while? Do you keep on working at it? Sometimes, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> 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 for a lot of reasons, you can relish it sometimes or uh, uh, you can't. Can't figure it out. Uh, yeah. This is a this is a Take it apart, question. question. Why do you think you're so successful? Uh, that is to say, how do you account for the enormity of recognition given to your work? I didn't that didn't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, you spoke of a negative, uh, a persuasive, a pervasive negative influence of the media. What advice would you give to a person trying to fight this? Say what? What, what advice would you give to a person trying to fight this, the, fight negative, the negative influence of the media, the pollution that you were talking about, the, I mean, the emotional and uh... <clears throat> That's a tough question. Uh, it is. Uh, Well, um, there, it's the way, the way societies organize themselves uh, in a kind of a natural way around all of the conditions that uh, are compelling in societies. Uh, there's a kind of a natural, I'd say that this breakthrough that's taken place in uh, uh, the, the communist country has something to do with this. Because obviously, all somehow or another, those people there had evolved a kind of way of living that had adapted and kind of adjusted to the conditions that they had to adjust to, mm -hmm. and that we do. Um, and maybe that has something to do with uh, the fact that the middle class uh, used to serve that purpose more than it does now. Uh, I think that probably. Unfortunately, the younger people, it's the fact that the younger people are having uh, more effect on the uh, society and the style of the society and that youthfulness uh, uh, of uh, 
thing that's evolved in our country through movies and uh, the kind of look. I mean, we're full of uh, we're full of the images of uh, movie stars. I mean, we we all have adapted ourselves to those uh, kinds of uh, images. In this example, um, it's in us all. There's a, some Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley and all of us. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's a personal contact. I think makes a, a big a big difference. It's kind of hard to say what you what you say about uh, the black people in this country as an example. Uh, I mean, what about that? What about right up here? You know, about uh, 25 blocks from here. Mm -hmm. uh, up at 125th Street where they got that methadone uh, uh, thing right by the railroad station, you know, where the mm -hmm. uh, people go by every day uh, going up to Connecticut and so forth. And it stops at 125th Street right there, the building, that building right there on that corner on the right going out. It's a methadone building. And all of these, uh, uh, you know, drug drug people right out there on the right out on the street. Mm. Do you have any control over who buys your paintings? And a second part to that question, do you care whether a work is shown publicly or privately? Uh, well, a lot of people don't want to, uh, some, a lot of people want to show pictures, I mean, you know, that they own, and a lot of people don't. Mm. I mean, um, uh, but in terms of what do you prefer a, a painting of yours when it comes out of the studio, let's say, to be shown to be in a museum or in a well, house? Well, there's certain of pictures that uh, uh, I remember that I, I uh, if I had a, sh a, a chance, I'd, you know, I'd like to get out and see it again or see it uh, shown again, or mm -hmm. it's, maybe it's never been shown. There are a lot of a uh, lot of work that gets done that never. Uh, that you remember that never gets shown. I mm -hmm. mean, publicly. It just goes in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you know John Day's work? No. No. I, okay. No. Don't know. Somebody wanted to know if you, you would be willing to put a slide up again of the triangle picture. Oh, that uh, Chevron? The Chevron, the uh, the I know which one. The, which one, the red one? Yeah, I or the other the one. The gray one, or the, or the the first one. The first one. Sure, put it yeah. up. You want if it? you can stand this, I mean, I've, we've uh, lost a few people. Uh, if anybody, we've only, <laughs> we've only lost the week of art. It happens. Every, <laughs> it's true. It happens every week. There are people who come, oh, they, that, they hang okay. around for fifteen or twenty minutes, and they go. Could you show the? Would it be possible to put up a slide and then we're just going to go for another minute or two? Yeah, they were put away. Okay, we can't do it. Um, You're talking about the, the red one, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The red one's got a green and white uh, band. Well, that's a picture that I'd put away and uh, never shown because it was a, a loose picture. Um, and uh, I didn't, I, I just remembered uh, when, I, when I painted, I, I might have Oh right, it was it's the it's the gray one. Oh, it's yeah. that uh, kind of a, uh, very uh, looked like a uh, like it was illuminated, like it was uh, had light in it, right? Yeah. 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 What about it? Well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that that think that may be a perfect time to stop. I do too. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 